I mean, what, what actually is the Brexit referendum? There was a term that was used. It's not legal. It's not legally binding. It's a something referendum. It's advisory. So even though it was a massive, massive um, thing that took place, it's only actually advisory. Um, it could be overthrown. And there's various ways that we're going to look at of, of it, how it could be overthrown during that. So that's what we were looking at um, today, we were looking at yesterday. What I want us to do today is to look at some of the technical things, yes, as we were doing, but not, not get to get too bogged down. There's two, two main aspects which I think will come up quite a bit of all the things that we've been covering. Particularly, I want to look at this nations and regions and how different nations and regions of the UK voted and why that might have been so. So we're looking quite a lot of, you know, we went through the arguments for and against, some technical things about the date of secession. We spent a lot of time on the social origins. Um, you know, we did the stuff about the, the, the referendum. We'll do that with you, Harry, on Thursday. Um, so what I want to do this hour, and I'm thinking that maybe we will spend an hour on this, you know, Monday, because I want to go into some detail. So um, we'll spend an hour looking at some of the deep stuff around the different regions of the UK today. And then on Monday, even though I've prepared stuff, I think it's worth doing an hour just on the different groups that are involved, because that seems like it's going to be another important part of the... Of the uh, it could be a question on there, something to do with different pressure groups. I don't just want to rush, rush, rush. Um, okay, so we did all this. Any, any further comments about all this social stuff? Surprised, unsurprised? By who was one side or the other? Not that you'll be able to comment on that, Harry. But um, were you aware at all of the different groups that, or had any idea of who might have voted Brexit and who might not have? If so, if someone would have come to say to you, who is the typical person that voted out, would any thoughts have come to mind? Okay. Okay. So let's move on then. And we had a little, we had this little section on, you know. Opinion polls. Why did I throw that in there? Why did I throw in a little bit about opinion polls and just being wary about that? Where's a lot of this information on how people actually voted come from? Or what their reasons were for voting? Opinion polls. Yeah, questionnaires. Qualitative or quantitative. So just throwing that in there is something to be you know, mindful of. Uh, right, so moving on. First off, a little bit of technical stuff. Right, so you may have heard, if you can write this down, so if you carry on from your notes. So we've heard this term a lot, or you may have heard this. Have you heard of the term Brexit, that hard and soft? There's not just one type of Brexit. There's different types of Brexit, Brexits, and you keep hearing this phrase, hard Brexit and soft Brexit. Um, now, I've, obviously there's notes in there, but how, would you have any idea of what those terms mean? I wouldn't expect you to, because obviously I'm trying to teach you about it. But it's about the different deals. And the different deals, yeah. So one basically hard Brexit, uh, which is something that the government actually wants, is basically it would just be a very harsh break. So this might be if negotiations break down and then it gets to it gets to um, 29th of March, and then we will just leave. And what will happen is we'll suddenly find that we've got no, there's no, the border controls will all have to be put back in place, including Northern Ireland. We'll have to go to what, what's called World Trade Organization rules, which means that Britain will have to pay tariffs, basically money, to every country that it trades with until it's sorted out a deal with them all. So that would be really bad. It would mean independence. And some, some Brexiteer people want that to happen because they want the, absolutely the, the harshest break possible to happen with Britain. So they're kind of good if it gets to you know, March the 29th and nothing's sorted out. Because, as we'll see, now this, process is, now this process is underway, it cannot be stopped unless the European Union votes no. So if we get to March the 29th with no deal, we, it won't be that we will just stay as it is. We will leave Europe. With not just in the, under the harshest conditions, on March the 20, on March the 30th, 
the borders will shut down. The border of Northern Ireland will shut down with the Republic of Ireland. We will lose all our trade deals that we have and it will just be a factory reset. You know, when you do a reset on your phone, we will just be independent, but we'll just be like shocked out of the system. So that will be a very bad thing. So that could happen. Um, a soft Brexit. This is... So what we're actually going to get is a kind of a combination, perhaps, of this. So, right, so a soft Brexit would mean that we will have no MEPs, we will have no commissioners or seats on the European Council. That's the part of the European Union that makes rules and laws. So we won't have any say on any of that stuff. We won't have any votes. Uh, but we won't, we won't be bound by EU law um, and we'll still pay membership fees to be part of the European Union, but, uh, but what that will get us is we will have free movement of, of goods. So we might still be part of the trading area, although we'll have no say over the rules, and we will have to follow the rules in order to trade. So we'll, how does that grab you, Connor? What's the point in that? Right, so the point would be that we would... Well, exactly, that's why people say it's ridiculous either way. Way. If you were to do that, then there'd be no point because you basically just shot yourself in the foot because now you've got to follow something that you can't like, have a say on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the, 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 the thing would be is that we could still trade freely within Europe, but we'd have no say over those rules. So in effect, we'd still be under those rules because the British laws would have to match up with, um, with the European laws in order to trade. So in effect, we would have to, still have to follow rules that we would have no say in making. But at least we'd be able to trade. So you get that trade aspect. And also, if you're a Brexiteer, you know, that's the main thing that you did not want. Because the European Union says, if you want to trade with us, you have to have the four freedoms. Goods, services, money and people. You can't just cherry pick that you want goods and so services. So if you do the soft Brexit, will we still be able to move to other countries? Yeah, because the European Union wants, wants that. But this is where you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Because one of the main things is that the Brexiteer people wanted the end of free movement of people. And the European Union is not going to allow that. that that's sort of what the, some people in the, in the Labour Party and some people, and definitely the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, they wanted that. So if they say, I mean, there's people that say we don't want Brexit at all, we get a separate, separate referendum. Then there's another group that say, OK, we will, we'll have Brexit, but we'll have a soft Brexit. So we will allow the, the free movement of trade and people, etc. But we won't be under EU law, and um, we, you know we won't. There'll be that set. So we'll be democratically free, but we'll still have free movement. What it's going to be actually in, in reality, again, could be. Um, so we'll list this on the board. So there'll be there'll be no free movement. But maybe we will try and match the trade laws, and what we'll have to do is renegotiate with the European Union countries specific trade deals with the UK. So we'll still be able to trade with them um, for a certain price, maybe at a reduced rate. Um, anyway, we'll come to that. I don't want to complicate that too much. Have we still got free movement now? We've still got free movement now until the tw until yeah, we've still got free movement now until the 29th of March. So. As it says there, but these are not the government's preferred model. So when we look at the government's preferred model, we'll see in a minute. Because it's kind of a mix of the two. Okay, Is this so what the EU's proposed? Partly, yeah. Because the, as we'll see, the EU's got its red, what it calls red lines. So they say, if you, want a free, if you want to be part of the single market, which I'll define what that is in a second, you have to allow the free movement of goods, capital, labour, and um, I forget the fourth one. But obviously people is, is a, you know, Brexit people don't want Polish people coming to England. So therefore it's like a break. So the negotiations is how can we how can we do this? Yeah, any, any other questions or thoughts? Need to clarify that? Just to clarify that that World Trade Organization rules, it just means that we would drop out of all our all our trade deals with the countries. It'd be like a reset and then we would have to negotiate trade deals with every single country in the world. Yeah. Whereas at the moment we're part of a single market, which means that we've automatically, through our membership fees, got got the right to trade freely with you know the biggest market in the world, the European Union, which is actually bigger than America in terms of economics. Okay, so um, 
So what is the government's negotiating position then? It's probably the most notes on there. And again, right, so I would, I would write this down, but again, the, 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 um, so you know, but if you look at the, uh, the, the pre-release thing, it says you don't need a really detailed technical knowledge of the negotiation process. Right, so this is the current Brexit negotiations. Right, so, um, have you, again, I wouldn't expect you to know, but uh, have you heard of this thing called Article 50? Right, so Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty is the, it's the treaty that you invoke if, you, if a country wants to formally leave the European Union. So this is what Theresa May signed. It's a document, and she signed it with a letter. And she sent it off to the European Union on the 28th of March, uh, 2017, saying formally that Britain is requesting, in the light of the... Um, the advisory uh, referendum that, that Britain is now requesting to leave the European Union. So that sets off, you know, a, a negotiation. Um, and even uh, the UK has set up its own government department, the Department for Exiting the EU, as it's called. So they're, apparently it's, it's going to be the most complicated and biggest sort of civil service law-related um, project that the British government has ever undertaken in its history. Because you've got 40 years of laws to unpick. Dealing with all manner of things. Um, so these are... Let me unpack what... Once you've got these, let me unpack what, what these mean a little bit. Right, so it, will, it means that the UK... What they've put forward is they want to leave the single market, which is... The single market, if you think of Europe... Really crap. It could draw a crap picture on the board, but can't draw Europe very well, but um, basically the single market is, you know, we're in Europe, picture Europe, the European Union, that means that people, let me get this right, so goods, meaning products, shoes, cars, whatever, pe uh, labour, meaning people, or just people, you know, go on holiday, whatever, you don't have to work, um, services, which means, um, you know, something over the internet, let's say, financial service or something that you do online, that's kind of like a service. Um, and capital, meaning money, so people can trade, you know, financial markets can trade. Once you're a member of the European Union, you trade that as though, just as though Lancashire is trading with Yorkshire. You get that idea, it's free trade, great for growth, etc. The customs union, right, this one's a little bit more... a little bit more complicated, right. So, as a member of the European Union, the European Union, right, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let you get this down and I'll back up with that one because I, I want to get this right, what the Customs Union actually is. I mean, there are many more red lines that the European Union wants, which we'll see, but um, they're two of the main ones. I'll just let you get that down and then we'll discuss it a little bit. So David Davis is the head of the EU of the UK side. You may have heard of David Davis. He's an MP in government. Um, I don't don't know that. I forget that guy's name, but he's the chief EU negotiator. Just want to make sure everyone's got those notes before we dig down a little bit, so I know that everyone's can can listen.
So that is, it's the money that the, basically, it's, it's the fees for the years, I suppose. So I, I forget how much Britain, Britain, Britain pays. I think it might be about 12 billion euros a year, something like that. It's a lot of money, but you know, we've discussed why they might get that. But it's also the cost for the disruption, I suppose. The cost that the European Union will incur for having to sort everything out once Britain leaves. Plus probably backdated pay and stuff like that. So basically, you know, how, how could you do it? If you were to leave your bank, or if you were to leave, if you were to quit your mobile phone contract early and you had to pay what was left up front, it's a bit like that. Um, okay, so let me unpack that a little bit. Again, don't need to worry about it too much because it's not asking for this, but good to know. Right. So do we, do we understand what's meant by leaving the single market? Because that's a big thing. Can anyone just throw that out there, what, what the thing's meant by that? Yeah, so free trade, free movement. And why would that be a really big thing for implementing Brexit, to get out of that? What, 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 does, well, what, what's the, what does it allow that a lot of people don't like, it would seem, that voted to leave? Immigration, free movement of people. Right. Okay. Any idea what the customs union might mean then? You know when you go through customs at an airport or at the docks? Um, customs is usually to do with trade as well as people moving through. And any, I know I'm expecting, I'm going to explain, but any, any idea what that might mean? One trade tariff for all EU areas. Okay, so... Let's say you guys are in the Europe, your three countries, well, let's say you're the whole 27 country of the European Union, and you're all producing stuff, and you want to, and I'm China, and you want to sell to me, and you want, you want to make what you're selling as attractive as possible, what might you be tempted to do if you're trying to sell me something, and there's, 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 there's three of you? Sell it to me cheaper. Right. So you might offer me... You might have to sell, it, sell me a pair of shoes for 20 quid. You might try and undercut you and sell 15 quid. You might try and undercut me, undercut these guys and sell for 10 quid. Right? So the, the, the customs union is an agreement between all 27 countries that they will only sell products at the same price as everyone else. So France will only sell a car at the same price as it would to, to China as Germany would, etc. Um, England will only sell fruit, uh, vegetables at the same price as Netherlands would. Can you see why that would be? So they're all, they're not undercutting each other. As a group, they're all trading with each other. But when they're trading with outside people, they, um, they, they have to have the same prices. I mean, does that sound fair? If you were in a club, you wouldn't want everyone to be trying to undercut each other to, to get the, the sale, would you? So that's what the customs union is. So why would the people who are also pro-Brexit, for things from a trade point of view, why would they say Britain must leave that system? Then we can undercut the EU. Yeah, then we can undercut the EU. So we can say, right, oh look, um, the European Union, if you buy it from one of those countries, these vegetables, you'll have to pay £2 a kilo, or we'll, we'll sell you for £1 a kilo. So that's why they want to leave, because they want to undercut the European Union, which is another bad thing because that's when people say we're going to become the sweat, sweatshop of Europe. Because what will happen is we'll leave all the European rules and all our tre all our all our legal protections for workers, etc. The government will get rid of loads of those, so we'll all become like you know little Chinese workers sweating away to undercut the EU. That's a rosy future. But do we get that? Why why the Brit would want to leave those or the Brexiteer and the government wants to do that? So what they want to do is replace it with a customs partnership, mirroring EU rules. So that's kind of like the soft Brexit option, but without free movement of people. So they want to be able to, let's say Britain would kind of match the laws and rules and regulations for trade with the European Union. They want them to allow them to do this. They want, Britain wants the European Union to say, that's fine. Do you think the European Union is going to allow Britain to, to just make up its rules? And why not? What, what, other, what might happen with other European countries? We'll do the same. They want to do the same. Yeah, so, you know, Britain can't cherry pick what it's like. Britain is trying to cherry pick what it wants from the European Union. So they want, they're basically saying, okay, so we don't want to pay any money, but we'll make our, our trade rules and laws and regulations as matching as yours as much as possible, so you'll allow us to trade while allowing us to trade with others, but we don't want any, we don't want any Polish people in our country. 
So that's quite a big kind of sticking point. Um, you know, border controls and free movement, pretty straightforward. We don't want any foreigners in our country. Parliamentary sovereignty, so we will. Um, European Union laws will no longer take precedent over British law. Um, we can withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights, which is something slightly different, um, but uh, that's down the line. They want to get rid of that. And no hard border between Northern Ireland and Aya. And have you ever heard the word Aya? It's just another word for the Republic of Ireland. And I just put it there to save you having to write the Republic of Ireland. It's just another word for the Republic of Ireland. So, um, because, you know, obviously they share a border, um, and it would be bad if there was a hard border, literally guards and border posts back up between the Republic and, and, and the, the Republic of Northern Ireland, because it would just, they move so freely. I mean, it's a land border. Uh, the EU, for its part, wants you, EU and UK citizens to keep their rights. So that would mean that if, if Brexit happens, that EU citizens um, in the UK will not suddenly become second-class citizens. So suddenly they would not be banned from this, that and the other. Let's say the government said they wanted to ban Polish people from being able to use the NHS. That that would not happen. That they'd just have the same rights. And that would mirror with British people in the EU. Um, and then there's that 39 session bill. I mean, that, that no hard border, I mean, I almost put that in a, in a box called agreed because they basically have agreed to that, that that's going to happen. The European Union and Britain don't want that to, to take place. So, they're, they're, again, there's going to be some kind of compromise there whereby Northern Ireland, strangely, will remain in the customs union. So they'll be able to trade across the border. But, again, that's going to be strange. But, anyway, that, that looks likely to... That looks like they're pretty much agreed on that. They, they, both in their interests that they don't want a hard border in Northern Ireland. Um, so that's that. Any other comments on that? I mean, as I say, it doesn't expect you to know all this in real detail, but I'm just trying to explain what, what the positions are. Seems likely. Do, do we think we're going to get a deal? or Again, um, just the other day, more stalling with the talks, more more conflict between the two groups and no, we're not happy with this, we're not happy with that. So who knows what could happen. Maybe we'll end up with a hard Brexit where we'll just get to the 29th and... Okay, so that's a bit of technical stuff. Right, I um, want to spend some more time looking at this Brexit in the nations and regions of the UK. So if you, that's your next title. So this seems to be something that um, comes up quite a bit within that. Uh, can you can you see that on the board? Okay. Um, can you so let me shut these curtains a bit? So in that pre-release topic, it just specifically says quite a bit about um, you know something that you need to look at or teach the tutor needs to make sure that we've spoke about this, we've talked about this. Right, so what do we notice about the yes vote, uh, the remain vote and the leave vote between the different um, nations of our United Kingdom? Uh, which, which countries of the UK voted to leave and which countries voted to remain? England and Wales voted to leave. Yeah. And uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland voted to stay, and Scotland massively voted to stay. Um, before we drill down into this, what, what problems do you think that might make up for our United Kingdom? Not reunited. Not reunited? Yeah, because you've got different parts of the country voting for different things. Um, again, I'm going to drill down into this. Is it fair, therefore, for the government of the UK to make decisions about substantial, air, substantial nations like Scotland and Northern Ireland who voted to remain? Why not? Yeah. 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 So technically, Parliament does. I mean, the government in London does have the right to overrule Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. But, yeah, but so, right. socially, and maybe morally, it's not right because it's going to create all these tensions, as you said. Um, 
again, we're going to drill down into this a little bit more, but what, what parts of, the, of England, let's say, the yellow bits, what, what do you notice about that pattern? Most of the borders voted leave. Yeah, most of the, yeah, that's, that's true, yeah. Um, what about which part? Down south. Yeah. yeah. London in particular, we're going to look at. And then you've got Leeds and Harrogate and York. They voted remain. Um, Craven actually wasn't far off. We'll look at that. Uh, but what, before we drill down into it, just to get us thinking, why, why do we think that the London and the areas around London were, were, were into? More diverse. More diverse, yeah. Where, what are they near geog geographically? What's just across the water? France. France, Europe. So what, what do you think a lot of these people may be? The, probably commute. The commute, some of them. Yeah, they'll be, they'll be a lot of people working in industries, I say globalised industries, where there'll be connections with Europe um, or just around the world. So they've got a more sort of, they work it, so they, they see it. And, you know, there's more diversity, more people coming across. Same with kind of Leeds. I don't know why Harrogate voted remain. But kind of Leeds and York, you know, Leeds is a big financial centre. People working with other companies that are all over the world, um, quite diverse. Um, again, York. I guess I yeah, sure. York, maybe it's a university town, so maybe a lot of, a lot of tourists, maybe people used to seeing foreign people. Okay, so let's have a look at this then. Scotland, massively pure yellow. Um, there are, there are ones which I haven't gone here that break it down into sort of even little county areas or little, into little wards and constituencies. And some parts of Glasgow voted uh, leave. Um, maybe there's more Brit British parts in Scotland, if you like. But um, it's just like literally just a few bits and they're overwhelmingly voted to, to, to remain. So what has this effect has this had? Scotland and the SNP, if you can write this down. So, um, Nicola Sturgeon, you, you're familiar with Nicola Sturgeon, so what she said is that it's democratically unacceptable that Scotland is going to be pulled out of the European Union against its wishes um, when they voted in. And she wants a second referendum. Now, she said she wanted one, another one, but she was pushing for a national referendum um, before the deadline, but... Um, she's now pushed back, I think, to say that, I mean, this is a, a second referendum, sorry, on, on Scottish independence. She wanted to try and organise one before the Brexit date, which was March 2018, but obviously hard to organise, so she's trying to organise one for after 2020. What do you think might happen? I mean, it's pure speculation, but do you think this could signal the end of the union? Do you think it might be that push those five percent of people that voted, you know, forty-five to fifty-five? The majority want to stay. Mm. They'll probably put that before. Um, like they'll change the decision because mm. of that. Yeah, because so many people overwhelmingly voted to, to, to remain in the EU. They'll push those people. They'll finally decide. I don't want to be in the Euro I don't want to be in the United Kingdom. I want to be in the European Union. Mm. Could be. Maybe maybe the EU. You know, this is the point is, is it's radically going to lead to, ironically, you know, is the end of the European Union going to lead to the destruction of the UK? Might be a good point to, to, to note that down. interesting to, to know about that. So what we're doing here, Connor, we're just looking at how it's affected the different parts of the UK and what tensions that might be. So I've just thought, uh, ironically, is Brexit going to lead to the end of the UK or the death of the UK? Because um, this is what Nicola Sturgeon has said, but it's un unacceptable for to Scotland to be kicked out of the European Union when they voted. So she wants a second Scottish referendum now. Um, and we were just saying that maybe we think that because so many people in Scotland overwhelmingly voted 
to remain in the European Union, that this time it might just push it over into independence. Okay, so um, another part of the UK which is going to be affected literally, you know, physically affected um, is, have we got that? Yeah, is um, Northern Ireland. What's interesting about this little, this, this as well, so that's the Leave people and that's the, the, the Remain people. If we have a little look at this before we, we, we take some notes. It's interesting, we notice that 60% plus or more consider themselves British. What do we notice about the areas that voted Leave? Close to the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, close to the Republic. Um, we know the tension. What is the kind of tension in Northern Ireland between? The Troubles. The Troubles, yeah. And it's between what? which groups? Unionists and Republicans. Catholics and Protestants, Unionists and Republicans. Mm -hmm. So the Republican people would be the people who vote Remain, and the Loyalist people would be the, the you know, vote to leave. So you, you were kind of shaking your head there, Shelby, were you? I thought you seemed disgusted by, by it. I'd like to share something with you, and how much of an impact it has on you. Like how that's shared across into Northern Ireland, just, you Yeah. yeah. That, that, no, I know what you mean, that entire conflict within Northern Ireland, and that split between people, it translates into everything, to into Brexit. Mm, yeah. Um, so just to come back to that then. Um, so Northern Ireland voted Remain overwhelmingly. Um, and there's this question, uh, if the UK leaves, will um, a hard border between Aya, I'm not quite sure you pronounce it, Aya, and the UK return? Now, the current negotiations favour this common regula regulatory area, a bit of a mouthful, but basically um, that will keep keep the um, Northern Ireland in the customs union at least, so they'll be able to sort of trade across the border. So there won't be sort of different prices between each part. So it'll be a special zone within the UK. So that'd be interesting. That I could see that that might have some economic advantages for Northern Ireland itself. You know, businesses might try and relocate there or something. Do we get that idea? They don't want to return to, got to show your passports. I mean, the Northern Irish border has always been a bit of an odd one in, U in the UK sort of geography. But, um, I mean, just a slight digression. I mean, do you think do you think it is because we are an island and that shapes the way that a lot of people think that we are? Going right to geography is a shaper of people's thoughts and beliefs and emotions. You know, because we are an island, that people feel separate from the European Union in a way which obviously you're French or German, you, you know, you just drive across the border. Do you think that has that had some profound impact on the way British Britain sees the British people see the world? I, I think so. I think I've always felt very distant from it. Yeah. Even I'm not. From Europe. Yeah, just like growing up, yeah. It's yeah. just like it's, I don't know, feel like it, it is, mm. like we can just go over. Mm. Even though it's just 25 miles yeah. on, a, on a good day, you can see France from Dover. Um, yeah, it seems psychologically different, distant, doesn't it? But then what I feel about Brexit now, I feel like we've kind of trapped ourselves on, on this island. I mean, obviously we haven't, but just feels, to me, I feel kind of trapped in a way. Psychologically. That's just my opinion. Other people might have a different opinion. <clears throat> okay. So, um, something else. So we, we mentioned with Northern Ireland, don't want to talk about Wales too much because, you know, they, they vote with Remain, same as England. What I want to drill down a little bit more into now. Any other questions about Scotland and, um, and Ireland, Northern Ireland at the moment? You understand the basic position that it's causing these tensions between the different parts of the UK. Now let's um, let's have a look at the uh, the regions. Then this is kind of interesting. So um, 
Right, let's look at that one. Can you, can you make that out? So it's the different regions of the UK and obviously remains in yellow. So which um, London, massively in favour, actually the only region in England that was, was overwhelmingly in favour. Everyone else was in favour of leaving. Yorkshire and the Humber, 57%, nearly 58%. Why, before we drill down a little bit more, why, why do we think that was? So people come to see people as others rather than as individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, if we look at this little map of, uh, of London, I mean, massively in favour of Brexit, 69, just within London itself, 69, nearly 70%. I mean, that's higher than Scotland. Again, why, why would we say that, um, we'll jot some notes down on the board, but why would, we, why would we think that overwhelmingly London is really pro Pro remain. More immigrants, globalised industry, massively globalised industry. It's the capital. Uh, what, I don't know what you mean, but what do you mean by that? So it's all about global relations. Yeah. Like you've got the Olympics and stuff and sports yeah. events that are held there. Yeah. Massive tourist centre, um, just completely globalised. Actually, if you were one of the most globalised cities on the world, in the, on, on earth, I think, second after New York, you're talking about businesses and the amount of people that come for business reasons, not, not necessarily for tourism, because that's France, but um, London, after New York, it's the second kind of biggest financial centre on the earth, so really globalised, whereas, you've got Yorkshire, um, I mean, particularly if you're thinking about most of North Yorkshire, what, what is it, as you've alluded to? Fields, Fields countryside, yeah? Um, Leeds, I mean Leeds is quite a big city, diverse, but again I would say it's because, I don't know if you know, have you ever heard Leeds re referred to as the London of the North? So, it's quite liberal as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is, and maybe that's stretching it a bit to say the London of the North, but it, it has a lot of financial industries. The reason why they say that is not just because it's diverse, but there's a lot of, of banking and financial services, which is by inherently globalised because it's trading all over the world. So you get people that are used to, again, York, a university town, a lot of people, a lot of tourists, so people are, are used to seeing people from abroad. Um, but we're going to get some notes on the board, but I suppose if you want to write down Craven, 52.2% to leave. So you guys live in Craven, don't you? So that, that's quite close, you know, within Craven County. Um, so diverse regions... With links to globalised industries, favoured remain. That's meant to say. So diverse regions with links to globalised industries, favoured remain. London being the absolute classic case. Um, I mean, do you think this is another example of referendums linking back by into direct democracy? Do you think this is another example of referendums being divisive? Might put that on the board actually. Good, good. 